Hi, my name's Anton Scott and I'm going on an adventure. I want to invite you to come with me as I look to have conversations about a life lived following after Jesus. God is a God of narrative. And we find our stories unfolding inside His great story. And I believe every human story is worth being told. We have so much that we can learn from each other. We add value to someone else's story when we tell ours. So come with me as we talk to all different kinds of people from all different walks of life and we explore living memoirs. Welcome back to Living Memoirs. Really excited to have you with us today. I've got uh, someone special on the show today. Pastor John Meat has lived an extraordinary life um, of adventure, traveling the world, and um, seeing some amazing things and experiencing truly a life and a life full of abundance as he has followed in Jesus' footsteps. Really excited to hear from him today. G'day, John. Uh, welcome to Living Memoirs. Really good to have you with us. Thanks, Anton. Good to be here. Yeah, I'm looking forward to um, just hearing a bit of your story and discovering some of the amazing things God's been doing in your life. But uh, before we get right into it, I thought we could just start with um, maybe just a little bit of a, a, an introduction for people. What, what, what is, who are you and what is life looking like for you right now in this season? Uh, well, I'm living in Ipswich in Queensland, uh, Australia, and uh, I'm married to one wife, Josie. That's and good. I've got, bonus. <laughs> yeah. I've got um, three adult kids and an adult uh, foster daughter as well, um, 11 grandchildren of... Uh, about, uh, let me see, where do they start? Five up to 21. And uh, work-wise, I'm Associate Pastor at Catalyst Church here in Ipswich, where I'm responsible for um, small groups, pastoral care, uh, those kind of things mainly. Awesome. Wow, so quite a large uh, family there, hey? Yes, yes, and uh, we've got... Uh, Four grandkids living in Ipswich with us here. My daughter and her husband live here in Ipswich. So it's nice awesome. to have them that close. Yeah, there's plenty to keep you busy then, hey? Sure. Mate, uh, well, what, what other things keep you busy other than family and work? So, like, what kind of hobbies do you have? If you, um, just sort of to switch off and disconnect? Yeah, yeah I'm, a, I'm a bit of a sports fan. I like, um, I used to play, even recently I played soccer. Um, but my cricket and AFL years are behind me, but um, mm. I still like going to watch. I still like going to watch sport. I mm. watch on TV, but also enjoy going to games, particularly AFL and cricket. Mm. Um, yeah, so sports are really strong interest. Also got um, interests in uh, art, uh, like painting, drawing, uh, I like music, I play a bit of guitar, I play a very bad violin, mm. and uh, yeah, just uh, enjoy those things. Gardening is quite an interest too. We, we like, Josh and I like working in the garden together. Uh, so yeah, sort of pretty keep, keep busy around those things, I suppose. Oh, that's awesome. Sounds like you've got lots of little uh, talents to keep you... Fairly occupied. Well, not highly developed, some of them, but <laughs> fun, fun anyway. That's it. Got to do something in this um, season at the moment where we're all stuck at home. Sure. Yeah. That's right. Well, John, um, maybe you could take us back to uh, where it all began. Um, love to just hear a little bit of uh, what it was like for you. Um, growing up in your in your early days. Okay. Um, well, I was. My dad was in the Air Force. I was born in an Air Force family. Um, Catholic family. So was uh, going to church every Sunday. Um, pretty simple life back then in the in the uh, early sixties. 
I grew up in a Air Force town called Laverton, which is uh, just outside of Melbourne, in Victoria, and uh, spent my primary years there. And at the end of grade six, we moved across the eastern suburbs um, to a place called Chernside Park, uh, about an hour out of Melbourne, centre of Melbourne. So that was embarrassing. So I had my high school years in pretty much a very different environment because I grew up in the western suburbs, which was a bit, say, a bit more struggling, an area, and went to the eastern suburbs, which was much more affluent. So it was quite a, quite a change of lifestyle. Uh, yeah, so that were my early years. Um, just pretty normal life, but I had uh, six siblings. Wow. I had, um, four other brothers and two other sisters. And I was smack in the middle. The middle child, you know, the problem <laughs> child. <laughs> <laughs> so what was um, school like for you? What was that like uh, going through school? Were you a, a high achiever? Were you a troublesome little fellow? How was it? No, I was more of a high achiever. I um, did quite well at school. I had an interesting contrast of school though in those primary years. Um, over in Laverton, I didn't feel I had a lot of friends. I thought it was a, the school was a bit of a struggle socially, not academically, but certainly a struggle socially. But um, then we moved to a, say, a new side of town and I was sort of adopted by a whole new group of friends. And life was, life in high school was a bit of a ball, to be honest. I mean, it was a total totally uh, different experience. Mm. So your father was in the Air Force. What did your mum do? Uh, mum was uh, mostly just uh, working at home, just uh, just raising the family and uh, yep. doing a good job with that. So obviously with seven kids, she didn't have much time to do anything else. Yeah, no doubt. And um, so you mentioned that your parents were Catholic. How how did that um, how did that shape your family, if if it at all? Um, well, as I said, I went to church every Sunday. We we would actually walk to church as a family every Sunday, probably about a kilometre, and uh, that was just just life. It was just life. So always always knew about God. Always had a, a reverence for God. Mm. Um, probably not so much a personal relationship with Jesus, but uh, certainly never known a time in my life when I didn't uh, know about God. So I'm certainly thankful for my parents for giving me that church exposure in those early years. Mm. So let's talk about that uh, personal relationship with God. Here you are now, a uh you know, a minister and have been for many, many years. What, what, at what point in your life, like, is there a point that you can say, hey, this is the moment where I drew a line in the sand and, you know, made a declaration or committed my life to Jesus? Like, tell us about that. How did that come about? Well, as I said, I was over there in a different high school, different high school environment, different side of town. And in my high school was a, a lunchtime program called Interschool Christian Fellowship, which was run by a couple of teachers. And probably from a year, year nine on, two teachers, Alan Meyer and Graham Drake, and uh, there might have been one or two others, ran this program. And I would go along, just as a matter of interest. I said I was passively a Christian, so, um, I would go along and check out that and I found it very interesting and I started going along to a Friday night open house it was called run by uh, Alan Meyer and Graham Drake and a lot of kids went to that like it was an interesting time because there's probably in my year level there was probably 30 or 40, maybe 50 kids who made commitments to Christ, wow. you know, out of the maybe 200 students at year level. So there's a huge mm. contingent of kids who made decisions for Christ. 
when I was one of them, in, sometime in year nine, the middle of year nine, I uh, decided to make that personal profession of faith. And yeah, it was a, it was a change point for sure. Yeah. Wow. And so it was just in one of these classes that you've been attending. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And was there any like significant people in your life that were a part of um, seeing that come to happen? Like, was, could you say that there was a, a person specifically who helped bridge that, um, that, that experience for you? Yeah, well, certainly. Alan Mai, who went on to become a pastor, um, he was a high school teacher, went on to become a pastor at Life Ministry Centre in, in Melbourne, and then later Mount Evelyn Christian Fellowship. Mm -hmm. he, he had a very um, powerful preaching ministry and communication ministry, so he was, he was a big influence. Mm -hmm. But so was, I started to go to a church, a local church, called Life Ministry Centre, and he would actually take a lot of us kids to that church. And the senior pastor there was Hal Oxley, and he was a major shaper in my life, just a strong teaching ministry. Uh, so that really did shape my life in a big way and continued to right through my life. That's he's only just passed away this year at 103. Wow. And um, I was still communicating with him up to about a year ago. Wow. So, uh, yeah, he was a major shaper. Yeah, that's awesome. So how old were you roughly when uh, you made that decision? I must have been 15. Yeah, I'd say I was 15. Yeah, about 15. Awesome. Wow, fantastic. And uh, life-changing decision. Oh, for sure, yeah, yeah. It definitely, I think my commitment to Christ pulled my head in a bit because mm. even though I would have said, yeah, I'm a Christian, um, my life didn't particularly match up with that. I was <laughs> pretty much one of the boys, yeah. um, you know, and enjoyed the footy, the football playing, cricket playing lifestyle. Might mm. have even snuck, it, snuck the odd beer in there somewhere too, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. between you and me. But, uh, <laughs> Yeah, and I'm not saying when I became a Christian, I I got completely ironed out, but mm. I was a bit more conscious about what I should and shouldn't do. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's awesome. So good. Well, maybe you could um, think about a, a miraculous moment that you have either been involved in um, or seen seen yourself or just experienced something that God did that was just like totally miraculous mm. yeah um in my own personal life not so much but i know Josie and i when we were um not long married probably about two or three years married Josie had incredible um gallstone issues mm. gallstone pain and um she'd been during the week to see our doctor and uh, they'd done scans and that and found these massive gallstones. Anyway, she was to have uh, an operation the following week. Mm. And then on Sunday night, we went to church. There was a visiting speaker called Jack Coy, Jack and Swanee Coy, who are evangelist missionaries, Dutch couple. I remember Swanee called Josie out and said, um, she wanted to pray for her. And said, um, oh, actually, she said, someone's got gallstones. So Jesse came out. Mm. And then Swanee, I remember, said, look, I don't often say this, but as I've prayed for you, I believe that God has miraculously healed you. Mm. So we went to the doctor on the Monday and got him to uh, recheck things. And the doctor, who was an atheist, he was actually a mm. friend of mine, but an atheist, he said... Um, well, something's happened. The, the gallstones are gone. You don't have gallstones anymore. Mm. We sort of said, is that possible? And he mm. said, well, it shouldn't happen. But he said, <laughs> he said, the body's an amazing thing. You know, we don't understand it all. 
And I said, well, I think a miracle's taken place. We said, John, I don't believe in God, so it can't be a miracle, but something strange is going on. I said, well, I'll, I'll call it a miracle, Peter, and you, yeah. you call it what you want. But So he had no explanation. Wow. So that was, I believe, a definite mm. healing miracle that we saw. Oh, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Called there's out. Been many, yeah. There's been many other amazing things you've seen God do. As far yeah. as that kind of miraculous healing thing, that really yeah. stands out. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I love that. And um, yeah, you could say it's coincidence, but pretty unlikely. <laughs> Someone called her out, prayed for her, and then the next day went to the doctor and they were, they were gone. That's yeah. amazing. Hey, John, what about your greatest God adventure? Now, you've probably had a lot, but is there something that stands out to you that's like, a sequence of events or something that God's led you into. And when you look back, you go, wow, what a God set up. Yeah. Yeah, it's been quite a few. Um, early on, my, my early 20s, I, I'd been to Bible college and I came out of Bible college and looking for what's next. And um, I went and did a, a diploma of computer programming. And I completed that and I was offered a position with IBM. And at the same time, the church I was going to had opened up a Christian school. And it was the early days of computers, you know, when there was things like orange screens and green screens mm -hmm. and no such thing as a colour screen. Yeah. Um, it was all black and white or this orange or green monochrome. And the school was wanting to set up a, um, a computer part of the school. You know, it was very early days. So we prayed about it. And it was take this well-paid job with IBM or take a job paying about half as much with the Christian school. Mm. So we decided to go to the school to do the take the teaching position. Mm. And so we made that decision, told IBM no, gone to school. And then the next thing is the school finds out from the education department, no, you haven't got a, you haven't got a bachelor of education, so you can't teach computing. Oh, mm. okay. That's helpful. So they said, you can teach PE. <laughs> <laughs> you can teach physical education. Yeah. So what? So I became the PE teacher in the school and helped out with the computers on the side and also became the scripture teacher in the school. And basically it's because I had the role in the school. About a year after I'd been teaching there, a position opened up with a, a church in Hillsville that had just been planted there. And because I was basically under the nose of the leadership in the school, they said, hey, you and Josie want to go out there and just visit and check out and see if that's of interest to you. So we did. And long story short, we ended up taking on the church and spent the next 26 years there as the pastor of the church there. Mm -hmm. I ended up giving up the position in the school after yeah. a number of years. And um, yeah, so life took a major shift, which... Who knows what God may have done if I kept, if I'd taken the IBM position. Did God mm. still not steer us? Well, of course he still could. But there's a definite connection between taking mm. the school position and ending up in that ministry. Mm. And of course, that, that ministry opened doors to all kinds of other things with Africa and Haiti and all kinds of those things. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Amazing how... Um... Yeah, God can lead us and in those little nudgings, open doors and take us um, into, yeah, some of our greatest adventures when we're willing to um, say yes. Yeah, exactly. Well, what about, um, John, you've been following Jesus for a long time and what have you found to be the most challenging for you in following Jesus? The most challenging? Um... Most, I, I think the most challenging aspects have been 
being willing probably to to do the unusual thing that um, is out of the norm. Like, um, so we're in a fairly settled um, role there with the church. And then something that came up to uh, potentially go and do some ministry in Africa. Mm. And so um, in about 2000, um, we decided to answer that call, even though it was, um, it was going to be disruptive, it was going to be financially challenging as well. So what we had was we had a, an, an organisation in Africa um, which was networking pastors, bringing them together. And another fellow in, another fellow in our movement called Richard Kerridge, he'd been going there for a few years and running those conferences. So I followed that prompting and, and, and decided to join him. So from 2000 till about 2010, most years I went to Africa for anything up to six weeks and wow. ran conferences in um, from South Africa right up the East Coast. We did South Africa, Botswana, Mozambique, Malawi, Tanzania, Uganda, we did some work as well. Hmm. So, uh, and Zimbabwe, did I mention Zimbabwe? We went there as well. So, yeah, over those 10 years, we, we went and ran these conferences, which were uh, challenging, um, but also very satisfying. Hmm. Wow. So, like, you... What, well, I guess, what do you think was the most challenging in, in um, going into another country? Like, talk about that a little bit. What was that like, going somewhere totally out of the norm, you know, to another culture, uh, probably another way of doing ministry and life? What, what was that like? Well, it was, yeah, it was amazing. I mean, my only, my only experience of um, overseas travel was... We took a trip to Fiji once, mm. one of our anniversaries. So going to a an often remote locations, dirt roads, back blocks of Africa, um, some generally dangerous places like Soweto in Tembisa in Johannesburg. Mm. Um, uh, you know, just trusting God in those situations. But mm. we, we had a... We had a um, a maxim that we that we always worked to, and that was we always worked with nationals. We didn't just go in off our own bat into scary situations. Just say, "Oh well, God look after us." We always worked with nationals, and I reckon that bit of wisdom mm. certainly helped us to be safe. Mm. Not that it wasn't sometimes scary. It was, you know, we were. We were held up by soldiers and police at various times, and it was scary at times. But mm. um, but God kept us safe, and apart from having a passport stolen once in Tanzania, and <laughs> having to take a all day bus ride to uh, Nigeria to get another mm. one, mm. Um, you know, things went remarkably well. But yeah, there's plenty of challenges. Yeah, for sure. You know. Um, a common theme that people have, uh, you know, brought up when I've been chatting with them is this whole element of trusting God. And, um, you know, I guess that, that takes a considerable amount of trust in God and, and that you're hearing from God to go to places like that and, and do those kind of things. For you, how, how do you know you're hearing from God? Like, what, what does that look like for you uh, when you're hearing from God and responding to him? What's that kind of process like for you? Well, I like to, I'm, I'm also a very pragmatic person. Um, yeah. um, so I do do the whole for and against, side by side sheet, you know. Um, reasons for going, reasons for not going. Um, you know, but in the end, peace of God can override all that. Yeah. And it's also helpful if you've got a wife who's on the same who's on the same page that 
and I've always listened to JC. If JC uh, has been cautious and doubting that this is the right way, I find her remarkably intuitive mm -hmm. and I will listen to what she's got to say. And I would say 95% of the time, we've gone forward in complete unity, knowing this is what God wants us to do. Hasn't been one of us saying, yeah, let's do it. The other one's saying, no, I don't think so. You know, we've, we've done it together. Yeah, right. And so when um, God like first initially put something on your heart, is it just like a small prompting or is it, how does it usually come, come to you? Is it just something you've heard that's resonated with you? Is it a thought? Um, how does that happen, that initial pull? Well, a lot of the major changes that we've had and the wrecks that we've had have been invitational. Like mm -hmm. I was invited to go to that, check out right. that outreach church in Hillsville. I didn't put my hand up, I was invited. Mm. When, we, when I went to Africa, um, I asked some questions, I was basically invited to go, mm. and, then, and then I became an organiser of it in my own right, and mm. started initiating things, but first of all, I was invited and felt a piece about it. Mm. And when we went to Haiti, um, which I can talk about, mm. going to Haiti, that was, a, again, was, was invitational. So yeah. uh, people there knew about me through my son, but basically it was, it, was an, it was an invitation. And I look at my life and a lot of things have been invitational. And then we've got to weigh up, um, is that God's invitation or is it just the person? And we've had, we've, had, we've had other invitational things that we've said no to because we haven't felt peace about it. Yeah. But yeah, um, basically the peace of God, I think, more than anything else. And our, and our personal agreement as a couple. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow, what an incredible journey so far and just an, an amazing adventure. Packing things up and heading on over to another country, another culture and experiencing firsthand the adventure of God in a completely different context. I hope like me you've got uh, many nuggets and gems out of what you've heard uh, so far and I want to encourage you to tune back in for part two where we hear the continuation of John Meath's story.